Hello class and welcome to video 13, Habit 4, Think Win-Win, Part 2. So in order to have a win-win situation, you have five dimensions we've been talking about. We're down to dimension three, which is a win-win agreement. On the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you a video called Green and Clean to illustrate a win-win agreement. A win-win agreement has desired results. You identify what is to be done and when it's to be done. In the video you'll see it's uh, the sun keeping the yard green and clean. Guidelines or parameters or principles and policies that are uh, to be followed in doing the job. The resources that are to be done. So the father has established guidelines with the son on how to keep the yard in shape, provides uh, uh, offers to help when he's available, provides the materials needed to water the lawn, to clean it up, the bags for the trash. Accountability is, is the next part, setting up standards for performance and the time of evaluation. So they agreed that they would check once a week to make sure the lawn was clean. And finally, the consequences, good, bad, natural and logical consequences, which would come to the sun for having kept the, the uh, lawn clean. So you'll see the win-win agreement in play in this video. My little son agreed in a family meeting to take care of the yard. I will, Dad. Son, your job is green and clean. Let me show you what green looks like, son. Let's go over to our neighbor's house. <laughs> That's the color we're after, son. Clean means, let's clean up half of it. Now notice that compared to that. That's green and clean, son. Your job is green and clean. Now, son, how you do that is up to you. I tell her how I do it if you want. How'd you do it, Dad? I turn on the sprinklers. <laughs> but you may want to use buckets or hose or spit all day long. All we care about is what, son? Green and clean. What's green look like? Good. What's clean? Good. It's your job, son. Guess who your boss is, son? Who? You boss yourself. Guess who your helper is? Who? I am. You boss me. I do? If I ever have any time, you need help. You just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And guess who judges you, son? That's right. You judge yourself. How do you think you judge yourself, son? Green and clean. What's green now? What's clean now? Good. Is that a deal, son? You think about it for a day or two. Saturday. How do you feel, son? I'll do it. Do what? Green and clean. How? It's up to me. Who's your boss? I boss myself. Who judges you? I judge myself. How do you judge yourself? Green and clean. What's green? Good. Clean? Good. Who's your helper? You are if you have time. What if I don't have time? I gotta do green and clean. Is that a deal, son? Deal. Deal was made did nothing. <laughs> nothing all that Saturday, all that Sunday, Monday, it's Tuesday morning, going to work, hot, summer day, burning up, yellowing, neighbor's yard, green and clean, manicured, garbage strewn right down the side lawn from a Saturday night barbecue, falling out the bottom of the sack, three feet from my car. I could rationalize a little away Saturday and Sunday. But Monday, this is inexcusable. I was ready to move to win-lose. <laughs> now, son, you get out there, you get over here, or I'm telling, but the moment you do, you kill the goose. You kill effectiveness. You go for efficiency. Yeah, he'll clean that up. And what happens tomorrow when you're not there? <sighs> Bite your tongue. Reaffirm your purpose. Raise boys, not grass. <laughs> I'll see what it looks like tonight. Could hardly wait to get home. Driving, going around the corner, there where my yard was. Tuesday afternoon, more cluttered, more yellow than ever. My son across the street, playing ball. I was burning. We'd agree that we'd walk around the yard, 
twice a week, and he'd show me how it's going. Hi, son. How you doing? Just fine, Dad. I was faking it totally. How's it going in the yard, son? Just fine, Dad. I bit my tongue. After dinner, why don't we walk around? You can show me how it's going. Before we got to the door, you could see his lip. <laughs> By the time we got out in the front yard, just open bawling. So hard. I mean, what was hard? He hadn't done one single thing. <laughs> I'll tell you what hard is, is moving up the level of initiative. You cannot hold people responsible for results if you supervise their methods. Any you want me to do to help, son? Would ya? What was our agreement? So you'd help me if you had time. I've got time. You do? I'll be right back. Ran in the house, came out with two sacks. He handed me one, he took one. That's when he signed the win-win agreement. And the older and he asked for help a couple more times that entire summer. It's his job. It takes time to set up the agreement and to reaffirm it. Tennessee is to backslide on it when you see mistakes. Keep believing in the people. Hold them accountable in the way agreed. So there you have it, green and clean. So that was a win-win agreement. The fourth dimension of win-win are systems. You get what you reward. You have to walk the talk. Here's a story that illustrates that cooperation in the workplace is as important to free enterprise as competition in the marketplace. Covey tells a story about he was acting as a consultant to a company and he was meeting with the CEO and the CEO was telling how he wanted more cooperation among his sales force to maximize sales. And behind the CEO was a curtain and uh, Covey was really curious and he said, you know, you've got my curiosity, what's behind that curtain? The CEO says, well, this is great, you've got to see this. So he went over and he, and he opened the curtain and behind the curtain was a picture of a horse race with horses that could be moved along from the start line to the finish line. And the finish line was a free trip to Hawaii for two. And instead of the horses uh, heads, he had replaced them with the heads of his sales force. And wh whichever person got to their uh, quota, sales quota first, won a free trip to Hawaii for two. What was he rewarding? He was rewarding competition. No wonder he wasn't getting cooperation. He wasn't walking the talk. So you have to set up a system to get what you want. And the last part of win-win, the fifth dimension, are processes that support win-win. Covey recommends a four-step process. First, you need to see the problem from the other point of view, from the point of view of the person with whom you're negotiating a win-win agreement. Identify the key issues and concerns involved. You know, what would it take to, for you to win? What's important to you? determine what results would constitute a fully acceptable solution to both parties, and then identify possible new options to achieve those results. It takes a little bit of creativity to do this. So here is a win-win song to the tune of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. I thought you might enjoy listening to it. It's kind of a break. I won't sing, I'll just read the words. Okay, so we want to create what's called a win-win environment, a reinforcement-rich environment, where reinforcement flows to both parties.
This is created by having natural or created reinforcements that are abundant. Sometimes you get natural reinforcement. I remember when I was a custodian in college and I would sweep a gymnasium floor with a big dust mop. I could see it was dirty. Then I could see it was clean. That was natural reinforcement. Now I'm te teaching. It's not natural reinforcement. I have to rely on the grades that students get and feedback from the students. So people feel valued and appreciated for their contributions when they're getting reinforcement. So what's a manager's role in all of this? The job of leaders and managers is to create a workplace where people want to be, a place where they come in early, work hard to get the job done, take pride in what they do, and know that their work is appreciated. Let me give you an example of coming up with a win-win agreement that I went through that was kind of interesting. This is a true story. My son was driving a car home from school and was rear-ended by another teenage driver. My son was driving a year and a old, one and a half year old Ford Festiva, little small car, and it was declared a total loss by the accident. Nobody was hurt, but in the insurance settlement that followed, the insurance company, uh, the other driver, has agreed to pay me the market value of this Festiva, which was $4,200. That's all. I financed the car through a local bank. I think it was Wachovia Bank, which no longer exists. When I bought uh, bought it brand new, and the problem was that I still owed $5,800 on this car. So I speak on the telephone to the loan officer about the situation. She asked me to come by and speak to her about it, so I do. Bef uh, before I go, I go by a car dealership because I've been offered $4,200 in a settlement and I find another car that I could buy for $4,200. So I go to the bank and I explain to the uh, loan officer that I owe them $5,800. The check's only $4,200, which leaves a deficit of $1,600. So she explains what the bank wants. They want their $5,800 is what I owe them. What do I want? I want to be restored to my former situation where I have a car and I'm making monthly payments on it. So I had to develop a win-win solution. So I said to the loan officer, look, if you make me pay you $5,800, I'll give you this check for $4,200, but I don't have $1,600. So I owe you that and have to make payments or figure out a way to come up with it later. Besides the fact that I will be without a car, having paid you the money, and I will be upset that I'm having to pay you money for nothing. You'll probably maybe even lose me as a customer, and you know, I might complain, and other people might hear that. That's not a good thing for you. And it would be better if we use, let me go down and, and buy this other car that I found for $4,200 and let that be the collateral on the loan that I still owe you $5,800. It's collateral substitution. We're using different collateral for the same loan. She kind of looked at me, I think maybe scratched her head and said, oh, I've never heard of such a thing. Let me check with my supervisor. Well, her supervisor was a different branch of the bank. So she called her supervisor on the phone, explained what I wanted to do, and then she came back to me and said, no, he won't approve this deal. I said, look, I, I don't mean to offend you, but would would it be okay with you if I went and, and talked to, the, to your supervisor to plead my case on myself? She said, that's fine with me. He's located across town at this other, other branch of the bank. His name is Mr., I don't know, Mr. Smith, we'll say. Go ahead and talk to him. And the problem was it was about 15 to 5, and the bank closed at 5, so I knew there was no way I could get there in time. So I went home, and I wrote a letter. And in the letter, I wrote it to this Mr. Smith, and I said, uh, if you ask me to pay back this 5800 I only have a check for 4200 So I'll owe you $1,600 still on the loan, and there's no collateral to back that loan. So it's a more risky loan. Plus, you'll probably lose me as a customer. I'll probably complain. And so you've lost a customer and, uh, and you have a loan for $1,600. It's unsecured, so you lose. And I'll lose also because 
I won't have a car and I have to pay you $1,600 for nothing. I said, why don't we go for win-win instead? Let me do this collateral substitution. You'll end up in no worse position than you were before. I still owe you $5,800. You're having accepting collateral that's really only worth $4,200. But I will continue to make monthly payments. I'll be happy. I'll tell everybody that you went along with this deal and what a great deal it was. And so you end up winning goodwill, and I'll end up with a car in my former position. We both win. Let's go for win-win. And I finished the letter by saying, I'm going to put this letter in the night deposit box, and on Monday morning at 9 o'clock when the bank opens, I'll call and see what you think. So I put the letter in an envelope with his name on the outside, went to the night deposit box, and stuck it in the night deposit box. Monday morning rolled around. I guess he got to work at 8, but the bank didn't open till 9. I called at 9 o'clock, and I said, Mr. Smith, uh, this is Steve Hyatt. And he says, oh, you don't need to say anything else. I read your letter, and it makes good sense to me. I've already approved the loan. You just need to go over and see your original loan officer and sign the papers. You've got a deal. I came up with a win-win solution. I said, thank you, Stephen Covey, <laughs> because this stuff really works. But it took a lot of effort. And it took creativity, but it can work. So what goes around comes around. If, if you th threaten some of uh, your people that work for you or punish them, it changes behavior immediately. But over time, people will counterattack you and seek to destroy you or remove you. So you think it's a win-lose, that you're winning and they're losing. But it's going to come around and you're going to lose and they're going to win. Those punished will be reinforced by harming you. They may even throw a blanket party for you. A blanket party is when you come out of work and you're the last one to leave and the people that work for you are all really mad at you. Throw a blanket over your head as you leave the place of business and while you're under the blanket and can't see who it is, they beat the tar out of you. That's a blanket party. That's not good. Or, maybe less drastically, they make fake sickness and not come to work, S work slower so you don't meet your goals, sabotage what's done, not good. So if you're always going for win-lose, you're going to end up with a lose-win eventually. You've probably heard the saying, you can tell a lot about a person by the company they keep. I say you can tell a lot about a company by the people it keeps. If we punish people, we eventually lose people. They will not enjoy coming to work. They'll either be late or quit coming or try to avoid you or avoid work altogether and eventually quit. So getting the effort you want out of people, it's not by going for a win-lose, it's going for a win-win. To avoid punishment, people will do just enough to get by. You'll get compliance, but not their best effort. If you give positive reinforcement, you get the best effort. If, you, if the employee's winning and you're winning too, that's when you get the best effort. So, believing in win-win. We're going to listen to Stephen Covey again talk about believing in win-win in the next video. to start with the person they have to begin to say I'm gonna go for win-win with people one man said to me Stephen come on I mean the world isn't like that I know this sounds good but really this is so idealistic and and it, you know I, I like it but it's really not like that I said well why don't you go for win-lose? He said, well, most of the time we do. Or lose-win. Sometimes we have to do that, but it is a competitive world. It isn't a cooperative world. I, I mean, I think you're living too much in the ivory tower of theory and abstraction. I said, well, I better listen to you a little more. Okay, he said, I'll tell you. He said, we try to go for win-win. We listen to your counsel and tried to practice it. In fact, just recently, we were renegotiating our lease arrangements with the mall operators and owners. And we had a win-win attitude. We were open. We were conciliatory. They saw that as weakness, <laughs> as softness. And they moved in. And they took us to the cleaners. 
Why did you go for lose win? We didn't. We went for win win. I thought you said they took you to the cleaners. Yeah, they did. In other words, you lost and they won. That's right. Well, what's that called? <laughs> and it was as if the lights went on. I did. I went for lose win. I didn't go for win win. Lose win is not win win at all. See, people who think in dichotomies believe that lose win, being nice, being soft, is win win. My friends, Win-win is so much tougher, much tougher than win-lose. Why? In the early stages, you have to be tough on yourself to cultivate the empathy, the sensitivity, the openness, the consideration, at the same time to not capitulate. What have we been calling that balance of courage and consideration? Maturity. And what is maturity a product of? Integrity. Being principle-centered, integrated around principles. Can you see why win-win is the fourth habit, not the first or the second? Can you see why it follows self-mastery? Win-win means we consent together. If you agree to disagree, is that not a win-win situation? We call it no deal. We agree to disagree agreeably. It's not going to work out. We won't hire you. You don't want to join us. You fully understand what expectations are. We understand what your needs and expectations are. And you can see that we're going in different directions. Let's agree to disagree agreeably. I would put no deal as one of the transactional options. We transacted. No deal on this one. Maybe we can come together at a later time. We transacted, see? The problem is, many situations, you don't have those options. It's hard to go for no deal with a child. It's hard to go for no deal with an employee who's been there for, say, 15 years. That would be essentially win-lose to the employee, just to go for no deal. Now, if you could come up with a no-deal option that has the elements of win-win in it when the separation takes place so that the person feels like that was an honest and equitable and fair settlement and you feel the same way, then that is carrying no-deal in a situation where you're locked in without any other options to a successful win-win conclusion. I'm telling you, no-deal is one of the most liberating options imaginable. I'll tell you why. Look. Let's say I'm trying to interact with somebody on a very tough situation. Say this gentleman here. And I say to him right up front, if we can't work this out, you know, maybe we should work out the best no-deal arrangement possible. But I really want to go for win-win. Let me listen to you first. I need to understand how you see it. I then want to be understood. I see. Well, no deal's always an option. I can be very open. I don't have to manipulate. You'll have a quality of a relationship. You'll have, hopefully, a synergistic solution to problems. The spirit of consensus in the culture. The spirit of synergy and decision. That's the end in mind. It's not that I got my way or he got his way. Now, if I'm deeply committed to win, win, or no deal, I can be so open and honest, I don't have to have hidden negotiation techniques, I can just say, that's not a win as I see it, but I need to understand more. Why it's such a win? I see. Then he tries to understand me, and as we interact back and forth, something dynamic happens that is absolutely magical in its effect upon the human spirit. Gradually, we conclude, no deal is best. Or, We've come up with something that is so much better than what you and I initially thought of. There you go. That's a win-win. So, you don't want this situation. The boss says, Miss Jones, how long have you been working here? And she says, ever since I saw you coming down the hall. Okay. So, 
she's really not motivated and he's winning and she's losing in her mind. So let's listen to win-lose conditioning, which is a talking about the public victory of habits four, five, and six. We haven't got to five and six yet, but it's kind of a uh, preview. is looking at how the private victory helps to produce the public victories, that is, in our relationships with others. And this is where habits four, five, and six are involved. Habit four, as you know, is to think win-win. Habit five, to seek first to understand, then to be understood. And habit six is to synergize. So do you want to come up and help me a minute? Look strong and healthy. You also have a very good looking head. I, Ron, have never lost an arm wrestle. And I don't intend to now. You're either going to be down there or I'm going to be down there. Okay? Now, <laughs> see this triumvirate right there? Yes. They're going to fund this exercise so that if he puts me down here, he gets the dime. Okay? Can the three of you have pockets that deep? Stand over here a little more. And if I put you down here, that means you give me the dime. Fair enough? You can draw on all of those behind you. <laughs> all right, now brace yourself, Ron. Put your elbows close together. Okay. Now, you keep track. You tell us when to start, all right? What's your name? Colleen, you tell us when to start, give us 15 seconds, all right? Now, if he happens to put me down twice, he gets two dimes. <laughs> so keep track of how many times he puts me down or I put him down. Okay, give each other the intimidating stare. <laughs> all right, okay, wait, start, start equal. All right, tell us when to start. start. <laughs> it's faster if we both win. Yes, I see. <laughs> I mean, literally, see, everything communicates war, contest, win-lose. So, while he's thinking win-lose, you think win-win. Habit five, you always seek first the interest of the other. See, so we start with tension, then let him win. Then let him win again. So gradually he starts to learn what's truly efficient. <laughs> He learned fast, but most people, seriously, I've had some situations where they just literally hold me down. <laughs> and I say to them, let's let you win again. And one said to me, no way. <laughs> I mean, seriously, win-lose poisons the mind. <laughs> you, you don't trust anything, see? Habit four... Think win-win 
lies at the very heart of all relationships. Think win-win is the habit of mutual benefit. It's the habit of the golden rule. It's the habit of abundance. The underlying paradigm or principle is abundance. There is plenty out there and to spare. So you don't have to be threatened by the strengths of other people. You can nurture competency around you higher than your own. It doesn't threaten you. You can share knowledge. You love to share knowledge. You can share recognition, gain, profit. But if people derive their sense of worth from being compared from the external, from the social value system out there, how well they stack up, they're always in a state of anxiety. They're always studying the pecking order. They're concerned about how they're dressed, how they look. They're into posturing, and they are threatened by competency around them. They feel that if they share knowledge, they lose unique advantage. It gives others the same awareness they have. They lose some power. If they share power, they have less. It's like a piece of pie. There's only so much. If you get the recognition, I may not get it. If I share gain or profit with you, I, we will have less. It's the paradigm of scarcity, not the paradigm of abundance. Most people have never had profound experiences with win-win people. They don't really believe there's such a thing as win-win. It's either you win or you lose. You're either tough or you're soft. You're strong or you're weak, see? They think in dichotomies, either or. Those people will inevitably produce politicized cultures where politics run things, reading tea leaves, social inventions, natural laws will not govern. Or they will become martyrs. They'll go for lose-win, particularly among the so-called important people. And then they'll often take out their energy on the ones that they can control so that their lose-win above win-lose below. What happens at the side all depends on the moods, the ego. What happens in the marriage, is it equal? Is it unequal? What happens with the kids? What about your employees? Can you begin to see that the roots of the win-win mindset comes deep out of the private victory? If the private victory is real and sincere, you're at peace. You're centered. You're anchored. You're rooted. You're established. Your ego is not involved. Down deep, you're invulnerable. So you can afford to be vulnerable on the surface of your life. That's why that private victory is so foundational. Habit four to think win-win comes from the principle and paradigm of abundance, not scarcity, meaning the pie gets larger and larger and larger. Why? Because through the interaction, on a win-win basis, a transformation begins to take place in our natures to where we tap into more creativity, more resourcefulness, more ingenuity, more wisdom, more intelligence, deeper and deeper into the bowels of the organization, deeper in our marriage, in our family life, causing synergy to take place where the whole is truly greater than the sum of the parts, and the wealth increases, the knowledge increases, the power increases, and the very fear is unfounded. Both are self-fulfilling prophecies, however. Whatever paradigm you believe in will produce the behavior to validate the paradigm, the perception. If you have the attitude of thinking win-win, habit four, and the skill, the method of habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, you will create such interaction, such mutual understanding that it leads to the fruit, synergy, new insights, new learnings, new heights. Okay, well the journey will continue as we get to habits five and six uh, and eventually habit seven. So this is the end of video 13, habit four. Think Win-Win Part 2. Make sure that you have participated or do participate in the online discussion. 
that you've done the homework that's due this week. And there's also exam number two for you to complete. So thank you, and I'll see you in the next uh, module.